Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Songwriters Across Texas podcast, where we get to know musicians through their stories, and we introduce you to some of their music. I'm your host, Carl Anderson, and today we're broadcasting from Arlen Studios. We're very excited, and our guest is Carrie Hudson. Carrie Hudson is the daughter of a retired Marine Corps officer. She was born in Austin, but was quickly moved to Southern California. As a child, she learned to dance. As a teenager, she moved outside of New Orleans, and quickly her and her friends would sneak out into the city and listen to music, and it got into her blood. She lives in Austin now. She has a band called Carrie Hudson and Good Company, and can also be seen playing with the pack. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for having us. She's going to play a song called Take the Day. Thank you. 
Hunter St. Marie on guitar. I was going to say, let's introduce this handsome fellow next to you. Hunter St. Marie. Hello. Not only uh, an amazing guitar player, but uh, he's also my my husband. That's it. Well, um, when how did y'all meet? Well, we we met in San Marcos. Uh, you know, that's about thirty miles uh, south of Austin, and we both were going to school there at what used to be Southwest Texas State University, now Texas State. But he was kind of more of the uh, songwriter country scene over at the Cheatham Street Warehouse, and oh, I was cool. over at Lucy's Retired Surfers Bar in Triple Crown. Yeah, on the other and side of the tracks. Yeah, yeah. On the, literally on the other side of the tracks. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So co- co- from all the way back to the college days. I was a theater major, um, musical theater, and um, you majored in English. Yeah, the yeah. written word. Yeah, So, nice. but we, we shared a lot of the same friends and rubbed elbows at shows. And so I, I'd known him for, you know, I knew of him for quite a long time mm-hmm. and had always um, really enjoyed his guitar playing. And I liked looking at him, too. Uh-huh. So kind of worked <laughs> out. It works out. <laughs> and then years later, I needed a guitar player, and he was in between gigs. You know, he was uh, played with... Uh, you know, projects had started kind of drying up, and we were starting to get... I was starting to get involved with projects where I was definitely a hired gun in the equation. I wasn't yeah. being part of the creative process. That's right. right. And that's all well and good if it's all well and good, and it just didn't seem like it was where I wanted to be artistically. That then, it's... That thing, I mean, it's good to get paid, but if it's if you don't get to have your ideas, it's well, not you know, the guys were guys were making records in Nashville, and they were coming back with records from Nashville, and they were presenting to the Austin band is like, well, this is how we want the record to go. I was like, well, you got but that was that five guy. guys in in <laughs> Austin that are playing with you. You know, what you couldn't right. use any of us. Like, we weren't that good. The producer didn't like us or whatever, and so it snowballed into like one act, and then to another act, and it was like, I, I'm ready to write. And sing my own stuff, or at so least then I try to sing. <laughs> and so what year was that? Was that, what, 2011? It would have been 2010, 2011. 2010, yeah. 11, so, and you guys hit yeah, it up. Yeah, I hit him up, and I said, you know, I'm looking for a guitar player. And I, But, see, I knew I knew Hunter's playing, and I, I knew the, the guitar player that I was asking for, and that's what I wanted. I wasn't bringing him on to, to try to emulate someone else, um, you know, and, and then slower, as we started playing more together, um, of course, a relationship built there, a uh, romantic relationship. And um, we did get married in 2014. And, and then we've been really kind of like finding our own writing style as a, as a duo. And it definitely came f- through during, um, you know, 2020, during when we were at home, mm. uh, when the whole world was at home, right. you know. And uh, our most recent EP is a reflection of our songwriting and also uh, his engineer work because um, we recorded it out of our home studio. That's great. And, you know, you hear a lot of stories about during uh, the COVID when everyone was in. It was like either, either you got closer or you, yeah, you know, or I think you just it, broke it's, up. You know, like. we we work together in every capacity. You know, we're not only a married couple, but we have a child, a five year old Hazel, and she wasn't given us at you know to us at five. We we raised her from <laughs> birth. And that takes a lot of teamwork, yeah. a lot of patience, you know, um, a lot of understanding. Um, and then we also make music together, not only in Good Company, our original project, but we also work in like the cover band scene because we like, you know, paying the mortgage. Right. Sure. <laughs> he's, you know, he's a sound engineer. Uh, yeah, we like electricity. It turns yeah. Out. Um, it goes a long way. So he does, you know, he's a sound engineer um, in the studio realm, but also in the live realm. And so um, we're that to be said, we are always with each other. And so being at home with each other wasn't some kind of stretch that that uh, caused us any friction. It gave us an opportunity to um, to bring you know new art into the world, which uh, doesn't always come easy when you're you know a parent and out there working. He's also a carpenter. He goes out and does you know handiwork. And um, I think people have this perception of a of a couple that makes music that they're just constantly gazing into each other's eyes, like right. over the breakfast table, like just like writing songs as as a like you know put the sugar in their coffee and it's just not that easy and so I'm grateful for the time that we had to be at home and and uh, write this music that we most recently have which is Take the Day that was one of them so uh, who, who comes up with what yes <laughs> I got you it, there's it, yeah, uh, depends. I you know being a guitar player being a, a guitar playing songwriter uh, there's the the not trying to fall into the depths of writing guitar-based music when you have an incredible singer that can emote and, and carry the tune quite well no matter what she's singing about. You know, the phone book would sound great <laughs> when sang by you, you know. Um, I think it, it really comes down, like that song was was plucked just sitting around. You know, we were sitting around the house and that yeah. I could not get rid of those 
those three kind of descending notes, you know. Funny enough, I was actually bathing our daughter, and I heard him playing that. He was sitting in our master bedroom just plucking away, and I was like, like, what is that? Like, like record that or keep that. I really like it. Uh-huh. And so when we got Hazel to bed, we revisited it, and I... I was sitting the next day watching the swaying chair on our back porch, just taking its way through the breeze. And uh, I was just like, that looks so easy. That looks so effortless. If only I could find that, those effortless feelings in, in, my, in a day, you know, and, and really sit in it, you know, figuratively and, and really like take that minute, take that day, whatever. And it's become kind of a mantra and, and the, the words kind of came really quickly. Um, and a lot of times they are spawned by something he plays for me. Mm-hmm. So occasionally I will bring journal entries because that's really what they are. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'll be like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Like this is the story I'm working with. And he'll kind of continue with it in the actual writing of it, of the words too. As you know, he was a creative writing major in college. Right. It worked out for him. And, um, but yeah, it's, it really is a, truly a marriage once again of, of – um, just the moment and catching the moment and and I'm and I'm drawn to something he plays or I just bring him some writing and then he's he's inspired by that it goes both ways that's great yeah our, our phones have a lot of hey send me this yeah. you know oh yeah. I heard that <laughs> you know send me that you know? that's really good that, that's that's inspiring you know one I of mean, the first songs we ever wrote together that's on our second record it's called burn we wrote that via email because we weren't supposed to be like digging on each other at that point in time it was kind of under the radar uh-huh. and so we wrote this this song that we just kept sending emails back and forth, you know, and uh, so if if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. You know, we'll find a way to make it happen. Right. Let's uh, let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's let's get to Carrie's be- the humble beginnings. Born in Austin, mm-hmm. uh, you have a military father. I do. Yeah. And why don't you tell me about him? So, uh, your in your childhood. Yeah. So I grew up. Uh, my dad, uh, you know, being a Marine and very passionate uh, man who raised, and my mother, who's no longer with us, you know, she was a nurse and RN and amazing at her work, such a devoted mother and professional, deeply cared about people, and I think that she passed that on to me. I, I care about people more than I probably should, you know. I get invested when I probably shouldn't, uh, you know, and I think that's what comes through in the music that, that we write, um, funny enough, but my dad always kind of he always told me, you know, de- it takes desire and determination. The two D's is what he likes to say. And um, I found that to be very true in this, in this, you know, profession that we're seeking, the, the dreamers that we are, and trying to figure out the, uh, the combination of dreaming and, and working it into business has been an interesting thing. But all through my childhood, you know, I had to have an extracurricular activity. I had to be part of a team sport. I had to do certain things to build my character and, and to see things through. Um, Your parents sort of said, we want you 100%. to do that. 100%. I couldn't just come home after school and sit on my, you know, whatever and just watch TV. And uh, I don't think we, as kids then, we didn't have as much to distract us as kids do now. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that the way that they raised me to get out and be with people and and use my mind and my physicality to achieve things, you know, really helped me grow into not only the person I am now, the songwriter I am now, and the mother I am, and the wife I am. Sure. Um, it's a culmination of all those things. But it was moving around that taught me how to be, you know, a little audacious and walk up to people and make a friend and not wait for them to come to me. I mean, I remember being five years old and getting into a neighborhood and saying, well, I'm going to go knock on doors and see who has kids, you know, and I did. I just walked That's where out. Hazel gets it from. You know, door, like, yeah. do you have a kid? And they're like, who are you, this little redhead, you know? But it worked out. You know, I made friends and I kind of kept that whole thing down the line and it built that confidence. I have an older brother, five years older than me, that is a huge part of who I am, mm-hmm. you know, helping me build confidence and by, you know, practicing his wrestling moves on me as a small child. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tormenting me, but now we're like best of friends, you know. Um, when did the dance come in? That came in pretty pretty uh, early in life. It, it, I was about six years old and I got into gymnastics, but I didn't didn't really enjoy that as much as I thought I would, so I kind of went into a, a dance academy and did tap jazz ballet and slowly got into the more performing arts side of that which was theater which when I got into the junior high age there was a theater program at the the middle school that I went to and um, I qualified for that and that's kind of what I got bit by the bug so to speak of being on stage and performing right understanding that feeling of when people are when you really have them and that it's you doing that right 
you know, I did a, uh, was a part of the Wizard of Oz and I was the, uh, the good witch, you know, that was the first time I used my voice in that kind of way. Great. But, but it was when we moved to Slidell, Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans, that I saw um, live performers for the first time. And I, well, let's see, I, I've seen a, you know, I saw Garth Brooks in like the Judds with my parents, big country music fans, you know, right. I've been to huge concerts. I've been in that audience full of people and seen that little speck on stage, you know, right. but walking down Bourbon as a 17 year old and my mother and you know, father did not know I was there. Um, and seeing live musicians, you know, there and not like young and pretty and like made for TV, like grown men, like the in the, you know, the preservation jazz hall band, like out there with big smiles on their face and playing music. And it really made me go, oh, OK, that's possible, too. This is interesting. And, you know, it was that about that time I did my first talent show in high school and I mm -hmm. won and realized, OK, maybe I'm good at this. And. When you were doing plays, was it just musicals, or were you doing? Uh... Yeah, at that time it was just musicals, and um, but once I got into college, you know, I got into like the one acts and did more like you know serious kind of dramatic acting. But that was also very short lived. You know, I, I I was actually talking to one of my professors at one time, and you know, he asked me, "What is it that you want to do when you leave college? I mean, do you want to teach?" I said, "Well, no, I'm I'm I want to act, like you know, perform performance degree." And he said, "Well, I think Carrie, I think you just need to go." I think you need to just get out there and do it because we can't teach you anything more about that. You already got that part. And so I, I quit school and I, you know, quickly found myself in my first band. I met these guys at a frat party, you know, my one of my closest friends would always make me sing. I was like a human jukebox, you know. And, and at that time it was like I was either singing Janis Joplin, like me and Bobby McGee, or like a Jewel song. That's when Jewel is like super hot uh -huh. with all of her, her super drippy ballads, you know. Sure. But I was singing them all the time and my friend just kept pushing me and pushing me, which I appreciate now, I hated it then. But I really do appreciate it now because I think it's landed me to be sitting in this seat talking to you, you know. Yeah, you um, have the, the friend that's like naked, you do it, but it, it, you're just getting performance uh Again, experience. I was putting in my, my some of my ten thousand hours yeah, yeah. in those in those parties, you know. Right. She was like my stage mom. You know what I mean? Like my mom was being a professional and doing her thing. So Lexi stepped in and was my my stage mom, I guess, for me. But but you know, over the years, singing me and Bob McGee and and being like that was kind of like my my thing. That was the Carrie Hudson thing. You know, it was always people at shows requesting that. It, it's interesting that that's kind of helped me find my voice. And then, um, and then that came back full circle for me years later, uh, in a really interesting way. But I, I was like, this is the genius segue to get to that story because I'm dying to hear it. Yeah, back in 2013, Hunter and I both were part of a production, A Night with Janis Joplin. It was put on at the Zach Scott Theater here in Austin, Texas, um, written and and produced and directed, directed by uh, Randy Johnson. Yeah, Randy Johnson. Um, you know, he worked very close with the Janis Joplin estate to make sure the story was accurate and supported. Um, and it was a beautiful uh, rock musical that, that discussed what she wanted to do with her music that she didn't get to do. It discussed her inspirations and not her death, not her drug addiction. It was, um, and Hunter played lead guitar on the show and I was one of the Janices. It does take more than one woman to uh -huh. be Janice, I guess. <laughs> We did uh, eight shows a week. Yeah, we uh, did. Between, did you uh, audition for that? Or? We did. It was a kind of a roundabout way. Um, a friend of mine in the in the music community um, kind of put my name out there in the hat, so to speak. They were looking for a Janice. And so the producers came to one of our shows at the Saxon Pub. Mm -hmm. And they asked us to put two of Janice songs in our set, which honestly, we kind of organically did that anyway, yeah. uh -huh. you know. Um, and so they saw us and... They were like, well, we definitely are into you, Carrie, but who's that guy on guitar, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then we came in, did a secondary audition and more of a close setting, and then we were off running. And, and the show closed in Austin. It went to the San Jose Repertory Theater out in the West Coast, um, and we did a full run there. And um, then it went to Broadway with a different cast. And so it was while we were out at the close of the show in, um, in San Jose, California, that uh, I got a phone call. And it was we were going to spend our last let week. Me, let me back up and, sure. and, and jump and jump in here. Yeah, as as you were saying, you weren't. There was the way that these things work. You know, you they set you up for six weeks at the show, and then there's the option for the seventh week if the show's selling well, right? And mm -hmm. so the show was selling well. However, because of the 
the muddying of the waters between our show One Night with Janis Joplin and the Broadway bound musical version A Night with Janis Joplin, <laughs> yeah. the way that the production was split pretty much took the lead Janis from the San Jose show the last week and put Carrie in the lead Janis role as opposed to a supporting cast. With so no understudy. With no understudy and no backup. So <laughs> Carrie did a whole week of eight shows straight through where she would have been doing all of the Janice routine. And the, the, it's a walking monologue into a Janice song, into another walking monologue, into another Janice song. So. So real low key. <laughs> real, you know. That, that, uh, but how big were the, how long were the walking monologues? It was a 45 long. minute two act play. Long. And the band's on stage. You know, we've got a horn section. We've got me on guitar, another guitar player, bass and drums, keyboard player. And, you know, the show would happen and there would be Janice monologuing and she would be talking about her inspiration, Bessie Smith. And then, boom, Bessie Smith shows up here and she's singing kind of uh, like an apparition almost. And then Janice is still monologuing. Bessie's singing and Janice monologuing. Janice is in the middle of the room. And then, boom, we're into summertime, Janice's version. Yeah, it was really And it was really well, yeah. you know, it's really well thought out, really well put together. It wasn't about... You know, Janice dying on stage. They'd already done that. You know, right. it was about, yeah, giving her a chance. Like, this is the next step in her career where she was going. Yeah. And it really made the interpretation all yours at that point. Yeah. You know, the director asked, he implored that we did not interpret. We were, it was not, or rather, we didn't, um, what's the word, Hunter? It, we didn't do a impersonation. Uh -huh. That we do I, our I, own, I we yeah, bring yourself right. into it. So I was right. able to bring Carrie Hudson into this Janice Joplin role. And in the closing week, uh, I was lucky enough to have Dave Getz of Big Brother and the Holding Company, the drummer, mm -hmm. uh, in the audience uh, among the other 500, you know. And um, we were at the close of the show. Hunter and I are just hanging out for another week in California, just kind of like decompressing from the whole experience, hanging out with a good buddy, Joe. And my phone rings. And I, you know, I answer it, and he's like, hey, uh, uh, is this Carrie Hudson? I was like, yes. He goes, well, this is Dave Getz of, of Big Brother and the Holding Company. And I just almost nearly dropped the phone. I was <laughs> just like, what? And so he called me up, you know, and he was just like telling me about his uh, experience watching the show and how moved he was by it and by my performance and you know it was just wow. not a phone call that I had ever expect to receive and um, we kind of continued a friendship via email he would share his music with me here and there and then we got into the studio back in Austin once we returned um, to record our our second record Don't Rain on My Sunny Day and we were out in this old farmhouse you know recording live off the floor with the band, you know, we wanted to make it sound as close to a live performance as possible. And um, Jeff Plankenhorn, our buddy, was producing the record, and he was like, do you guys have something like kind of wild card-ish about something we can add to this record, you know, to kind of maybe bring some interest to people that, you know, maybe don't know who you are and kind of need a little extra, you know, impulse to mm -hmm. listen, which, because come on, there's so much of us, so Absolutely. many of us out there, right? That's right. Jeff so, knows what he's talking about. Incidentally, Dave Getz hits me up via email, and he's, you know, he says, you know, I've got this song, we never got to record it with Janice. But back in 69, during a sound check, she scribbled down some lyrics on a napkin. And I kept them over the years. And we all know she left us too early. And uh, he put some music around it, but they never really did anything with it. And he said, you're in the studio. Why don't you guys see what you can do with it? And so we did. You know, we, he sent me a, you know, the coolest St. Carl is he sent me this email of the, her handwritten lyrics. I'm just looking at them. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow me and the band are gonna get a chance to lift these off the page, you know? And that's a, it was a really intense experience to sit around that kitchen table in that farmhouse, work out the music with good company, put our spin on it, and we sent a little iPhone recording of it to Dave to get his blessing, like, do you like this arrangement? And he's like, I'm blown away, love it, I can't, I can't believe it, yes, do it. So we did, it's on the second record, uh, it's a song called Can't Be the Only One. Lyrics by Janis Joplin and music by Carrie Hudson and Good Company. I, that, that is such a lovely... We're going to get to hear it. Yeah. Are you guys going to play it for 100%. us right now? Right. Awesome. You want, yeah, you need out? Please. Okay, cool. <clears throat> that brought like a tear to my eye okay. listening to that Aww. story. Mm. people 
are weeping, crying in the night time. It still don't make it right. No, it don't make it. So awesome, man! Did you write the music? So we, yeah, music so we have a uh, a five piece band, you know, and uh, keys, drums, bass, me and and, and Carrie now, and uh, we're sitting in in the kitchen, and with this guitar, we just kind of start <laughs> strumming through it. And uh, there was a recording of it prior to what we did. Like she said, they they had written the song, they had tried it out with another singer, Dave, in his own solo project, had tried it out. So there was there exists a recording of it that was never fundamentally released with any sort of fanfare. I right. see. And so we kind of drew on that. You know, he had his parameters as far as sticking with the way that the, the melody lines go and the way that it's sung, but we had to adapt it to her voice and her key that was strong enough. And so after we're playing it around the kitchen table, like she said, we sent him a, a, an iPhone recording of it and just, here's the four of us, you know, guy on a Wurlitzer, kind of acoustically, me on acoustic guitar, drummers clapping in the background. Yeah, that's yeah. great, you know? <laughs> Right. And so just from there, add the swagger to it that's that is that speaks of these guys that I have on stage with me with good company. I mean, they're all just immensely talented players in their own right, and they all have their own musical story that lends them to play their instrument the way they do. Sure. And, and so, you know, all of them sitting around that table in such an organic way, it just really came together quickly. And it, it really was just about energy, and it was just about intention. And the story is there. You know, it's, it's it's a timeless story. And if you listen to the words of the song, nothing has changed. You know right. what I mean? Yes. There's still heartache in the world, and it's exactly. one person crying is one too many, right? That's right. So yeah. it was an easy story to sing as if I wrote it because it's it's pretty livable, you know? Absolutely. There's something Bonnie Raitt said a long time ago in an interview that I really uh, resonated with, is that she really only wants to sing a song if she hasn't written it that she believes she would have written herself, you know, so she can sing from a really honest perspective. Um I, that's something that I'm deeply in search of, and that is very important to me as a not only a person but uh, a singer, um, uh, an artist. I have a hard time calling myself an artist. It just seems like I'm an artist, but I'm a person that writes music and in hopes for the best, you know. But I just really am focused on what's real and what's authentic, 
um, because there's a lot of BS out there. You know what I mean? Well, as a, uh, I'm, I always think of uh, singers as, as performers and that, yeah. that you have a character you're playing. And yeah. it's, there's, you know, people like David Bowie or Tom Waits, it's easy to go, well, they, they kind of, they really get, show you those characters and they write it in there. But I remember I went to John D. Graham. I was making a movie and, uh, and I said, I want you to play this kid's father. And uh, and he goes, oh, Carl, Carl, I'm not an actor, you know. And I was like, yeah, yeah you are. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I said, don't worry, I won't let you, you know. Like, I'll be there, and I'll, you'll be great, you know. And he was, but that, like, the fact is, is that you got a character that you created, mm-hmm. and you go out on stage. Hundred percent. The person I am, the one I walk on stage, is is the Carrie Hudson you're sitting and talking to now. But it's like the the one that believes in herself the most. It's the most elevated version of myself. It's the most confident version. Yeah. It's the most open uh, person, you know, that I can bring to the table. And uh, for some people, it might not be their cup of tea, but for me, there's a lot of freedom in that. And, you know, I, I hope that somebody can resonate with that uh, level of honesty, you know, and comfort in, in being who they are. Let's uh, talk about it because you, you not only have the, the Saxon Pub where you play uh, – we do the first Thursday of every month there at 10 o'clock. First Thursday, right. Yeah. But then you also do happy hours with yeah. the pack. Yes. Who I'm a just huge fan of the pack, and uh, I think it's wonderful. I do, too, and I'm honestly just so happy that I was that I answered the phone that day when Andrea called and that I was available. Because the truth of fact, you know, there's five of us women that all front our own bands in Austin, and we, we sit together um, on stage, and we, we lift each other up through music. And, and friendship and we all play our own songs that we also play with our our bands mm-hmm. we have yet to write a pack song mm-hmm. um but the thing about it is is those girls you know they they learn each of our songs and we get up and we perform them and it's just truly just like it's a hoot i mean we're just having fun with each other you know but there are there are you know heavy moments on stage because we are people that are living and and we're writing songs about things we are experiencing and um, the way that the happy hour crowd that is always packed takes on our, our songs and our sentiments is really beautiful. And I, I do know that if I hadn't answered the phone that day and if I hadn't been available for the original idea of pack, it could have been someone else in that seat because there's a lot of us swimming around in this fishbowl here in Austin. Sure. And um, so every night that I sit up on that stage with them every Thursday, I, I realize that I'm lucky to be in that seat, you know. Thursday happy hour, 6 o'clock. Yeah. At- uh, every Thursday, yeah, that, I I love going down for I that do happy hour. It's, uh, They're it's like a good the, time. Uh, the resentments, but it, with bras. It's, it's totally <laughs> well, one, that's one exactly one right. Ever. But when I was I Looking was you, impressed Kelly. At you. with broads. broads. <laughs> I love it. Um, I was I was impressed because uh, Eddie Wilson was out and Joe's out, and it's like you know these are like the some of the most important They're pillars the pillars and, and that you know you think eddie you know he's retired from the game but he still likes to come out who's he going to see yeah it's y'all been, actually it's been really cool to um to see the amount of of men out there enjoying the show and i and i you know some might argue well yeah there's five women on stage like but i don't think that's it i don't think it's a gawking thing i think it's a matter of it's definitely not a it's gawking there's thing. something really special about people sitting in solidarity with one another and it just truly being felt you know like that it's not ego up there, it's not competition, which in this industry, if you're not putting yourself up against another female, you know, speaking for myself, someone else is trying. You know, sure. I hear it all the time. Oh man, um, I really like that singer, but you're better. Or, you know, it's like, why do you have to say that? Like, I, I'm not worried about being better than her. I'm actually learning a lot from her. I'm at, I'm at the show, I'm watching her. People. I'm a fan of hers. Like, why are you trying to pit us up against each other? They're so right. it's the um people are funny. Yeah. They try to pit the stones against the Beatles. You know, people <laughs> yeah. to this day will still go, Are you stones or Beatles guy? Right. And I'm like, I'm both. Man. Yeah. I, I like apples and oranges. We own I don't, all the yeah, records, I don't yeah. do without either. I like the whole fruit basket. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so you've been in, but the, I, I want to stay on the Saxon for a minute because I just, I fu- that room is very important mm-hmm. to this city. And you, Ruby. you yeah. get to feature oh. both of y'all, you know, and like, how is, what is that like? To- well, to be in a room that's as, as important as the Saxon pub, I, I, you know, it's, it's something I don't take for granted. I've been playing that room since I was 19 years old. 
I've been pissing off Richard Vanoy since I was 19. <laughs> Reverb in the monitor, please. Uh, but uh, love you, Richard. Um, love you, Richard. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, that place is home to me and to Hunter. Um, you know, I, they recently put out a documentary about the Saxon Pub. Mm. And I was really, really stoked to be a part of it. Our band was a part of it. Um, to be part of that, to, of the thread in, in that story, you know, um, was, I felt very honored, you sure. know. So every night that I step on stage in that place is, is a good night, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting. It's a good blend of listening room to rock club. Um, you know, you, see, you can get both there. Yeah, I agree. You know? That's true. Um, the uh, documentary, t- do you know where people can get their hands on it's it? Called Nothing can you Stays watch? the Same. Mm-hmm. What's that? Nothing Stays the Same. Nothing Stays the Same. Yeah, it's a wonderful, iTunes? wonderful iTunes. show. iTunes, okay. Google Play, yeah. Apple Music. Uh, it's available on most platforms now. I the think. Saxon Pub uh, website, I think, as well. Saxon Pub website. It's okay, a Saxon uh, Pub. very com, good sure. uh, <laughs> documentation of the ever-evolving landscape of Austin fundamentally and musically. Yeah. Like they, they really get into it and how the ability of of individuals to lift up the musical community and, uh, you know, really keep keep the lights on, keep the business going. Man. Yeah, I know it's certainly uh, it's hard in that we've lost a lot. And then when, you know, the, the COVID hit that we lost more. And Seeing uh, some of the clubs that we, I mean, we grew up in just vanish. Thread Gills. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was, was a, a tough one. It's uh, yeah. it's really heartbreaking, and you know the tr- the fact of the matter is Saxon was going to move. It was going to move to the warehouse district, like over by St. Elmo. They were planning a hold out build out there, and it was the Saxon Pub was going to survive, but it wasn't going to be that same room with all that wood and that special place, right? And so, a very very special realtor in town came yeah. in and saved that joint. That's and, right. And because of it, color, you know. Don't spoil the movie. You, <coughs> well, yeah, but it's not yeah. spoiled. People know this, it's, right? Uh, and at the know. end, no. Well, it's still there, so clearly it didn't get pulled away, yeah. right. right? And we're still playing their live it's, at yeah. Budokan. And yeah. it's well, it's even nicer. Like, he, I, yeah, my, I, Have my, you seen my the friend bathrooms? came in. Yeah, my friend, my friend came and he he was he hadn't been in there in a long time, and he came out of the bathroom. He's like. Dude. Yeah, it's so funny. That's like the number one thing that people <laughs> it's would be reporting back about. I said it for the first I'm time. Like, right, but how was, was my like, show? My how was the show? No, the bathrooms. Yeah, I know about the bathroom. <laughs> you should have seen them before. <laughs> well, and you know, to, to 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 further on that point about places closing as we've come up musically in, in this town. You know, I know we've only been here the twenty some odd years that we've been kicking around. Uh, you know, comparatively to see the the venues that have changed and have, uh, you know, cut and run or been forced to close, <clears throat> Hovitas and, you know, some of the places that we started out at, Momo's and all these places now yeah. are, are turned into newfangled clubs or there's multi-use businesses there. and uh, We're just holding is. on. We're holding on as tight as we can. Yeah. I feel like it's, it, I, in a way, I feel like it's just par for the course in any city, though, because sure. I, I lived in New York City and, you know, I got there and CBGB's was still there, but it's not now. No, I think you it, know. you know, change is the only constant we have. I know it's like, woo, Carrie, way to, you know, say that the cliche there, but it is. I mean, is is. you have to understand but, that it's going to happen, and you and you, I think at first we get we get a little grouchy about it because we want to hold on to something as if it's ours. But the truth of the matter is, this city is not ours. It's it's meant to grow. It's meant to flourish. It's meant to take on youth and younger ideas and things like that. And um, I'm just happy to still get called to play, you know, every now and then, like, because, you know, there's a whole other group that's going to be swinging in, you know? Well, right. The generations are, yeah. are it's already happening. In yeah. fact, the next guy up is 19-year-old Calder Allen, who's uh, Dale Allen's son. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Nice. And, mm-hmm. you know, his grandfather's Terry and his grandmother's Joe Harvey, you know? And so it's like, this kid is, but thank God. You know, that he's there. Yeah, of course. I mean, Hazel picks up an instrument all the time in her house, and I'm like, you don't have to do it, but please, I mean, carry the torch, kid. You know what I mean? If, if that's what she wants. But we're carrying the torch for the ones before us, and, True you that. know, so that's how it just works. Yeah. Just like, you know, clubs, you got to you got to have thread gills for as long as you did. No, you don't. Yeah, it's a sad and everything, but, and so there's the ones like Saxon where you like, man, you know, this is important. You know, we we don't have too many of these left. Right. Yeah, Continental and Sea Boys, Antones yeah. got the spoke. Antones has moved twice since I've lived yeah, in town. And yeah, you know, and so like three times, that's kind of the that's what it does. You yeah, know? and that's how the world keeps turning, man. Right, that's what's a good thing it's, about this sort of thing. Right, and I think 
I think it's in a pretty good spot right now, Anton. I used I to work at Lucky Lounge when it was right next door to it on Lavaca Street. So I have that holds a special place in my heart on Fifth and Lavaca, right there. Right, so, uh, but, that's where know. I went to a lot of oh, stuff man. at that place. Yeah, so I many had good some shows. Fun nights in there. Yeah, I remember all my nights at Lucky Lounge. <laughs> you what now? You weren't you weren't working there. <laughs> that was a different time in my life. I wanted to go ask you about Cheatham Street and like what that was like back then, and then we talk about how things change if, if you've been in there recently sure. and if it still has a yeah. you know a similar vibe. I uh, I got thrown into trial by fire by a good friend of mine. Uh, I grew up in Galveston, Texas, and I moved to San Marcos to go to college. And in one of my big theater classes, randomly sat next to a, a gentleman that I recognized but didn't really know, and we got to talking, and he's from Dickinson, which is right across the causeway from Galveston, and we start talking about Galveston and, and everything down there, and he's like, man, I, I, I work at this club. You should come by and check it out. And uh, which one? Oh, Cheatham Street. And I was all oh, I've been down there on Monday nights sitting in with the, the All-Star Band. They used to have an open mic that was the ace in the whole band, mm -hmm. was the backing band. Yeah. And you could get up there and play with the ace in the whole band. And right. as a 19-year-old transplant from Galveston, didn't really know the ace in the whole band personally at the time. But then playing with them, and you walk in, and everybody's singing you know, George Strait songs. Everybody's singing you know, Merle Haggard songs because Red's there playing guitar. And everybody knows these songs at the back of their hand. And I put my name on the list. I was kind of like, well... Um, got on stage. There's these dudes. They look kind of crusty and old. This is going to be fun. You guys know any Almond Brothers? Let's play Statesboro Blues. And Daly pops up from behind the steel. He goes, Yeah, let's do that. You know, they were so tired of playing the stuff they always play. Like, let's do something different. Right on. And so I started doing that. And so when my friend told me, he's like, You got to come and do the, you know, come do sound over here. I was like, Well, I'm already hanging out over there. Let's just see what it's all about. I can get paid to hang out here too. Yeah, let, let's do that. Turn some knobs. I hadn't. I hadn't sat behind a console ever. My dad had a powered PA head and some speakers, and so I knew that if you have a band, you need to have a PA, you need to have the vocals out there. Um, but getting in here, there, here. Getting, <laughs> getting, getting behind the board, which was arbitrarily 15 feet from the speaker stack right here, so you were not missing anything. I'm sure they got closer here in the control room than I was. But, you know, here's a compressor, the reverb's on aux one, monitors are two through four and so forth, and you start learning how consoles are laid out. And for me, I think the first thing that happened was getting to work a song swap. And what's well, a song swap? Well, and Kent, the owner, well, now they're gonna sit there, and it's gonna be three gentlemen on guitars, and they're gonna, one's gonna sing a song, next one's gonna sing, okay, cool, they're just gonna sit there and pass songs around, that's cool. It was uh, Sled Cleaves, Adam Carroll, and uh, a young Graham Weber who had just moved to town from Cincinnati. Right on. And I, it was my first day there without training wheels, without anybody kind of helping me get the, and it was just everything I could do to not freak out because it was <laughs> so good. I was just floored. And it, 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 you know, it turned me on to singer songwriter crew and like these dudes and then it was a snowball effect from there. So like Tuesday night was this show, Wednesday night was a songwriter night, Thursday night there was a new up and coming alt country band playing. And you know, my friend moved, he was like, I gotta go back to, uh, to Dickinson for the summertime. So it's your gig, man. And so I was the sound guy at Cheatham Street for three or four years. And I mixed a lot of bands through there. The Randy Rogers band were always in there. Uh, you know, Ryan Turner, all these dudes that were coming up, coming up songwriters in the alt country, the Texas country, Americano. Right. All these dudes came through there, and they all played either acoustic or with their bands. And it was a good experience for me as, as training my ears, but also watching bands and watching what bands did and how they performed and yeah. which ones were like, sure. man, that worked. That made the hairs on my arm stand up. Those guys were awful. God, how did they get booked here? Yeah. You, know, like, <laughs> so, you know, you saw it all. And that was, the I think, the cool thing about Cheatham. And, you know, Kent, bless his heart, that he was one of the original stalwarts of, you know, that cobweb stays there. You know, yeah. that's part of the that's part of the allure. Ambiance. Um, Absolutely. You know, like they didn't sell liquor in there for a long time because they wanted to keep it about the songs and not about selling booze. And so they had nothing but beer and wine for a long time. And I like it. when we went back uh, to watch Plank play a song swap, uh, and it was him and uh, and I think it was Adam Carroll again. It was. And it was like full, you know, Adam played, uh, uh, there's a song he does, uh, Girl with the Dirty Hair, and he mentions Galveston where I grew up. And I love that song. <laughs> and it was like I could not not have been in more tears that night watching that go down because it was so different coming back 20 years after the fact. 
mm-hmm. and seeing these same dudes that I had started mixing originally. Well, and being a songwriter now, not just a hired gun guitar player, like really being involved in the songwriting process and having been steeped in it and yeah. then having, you know, yeah, Coming that's what home. I'm. That's that's where I'm glad yeah. that we yeah. talked about yeah. that because you know. it's important. And I mean that, that you, all the talent gravitates towards rooms like that. And you know, like I I remember hearing stories about she them when it was like, uh, you know, McMurtry and uh, Terry Hendrix. That was the uh, yeah. Kent's big thing was the class of uh, I don't, I'm going to make this eighty three class of eighty six. That's Six. what it was. Okay. I didn't want to go too old. Sorry, James. Um, <laughs> but like you know, yeah, that was a class of eighty six. It was James. It was uh, Terry Hendrix, and there was somebody else that it, was that was involved in that. Uh, Dude, uh, Todd Snyder. Yeah, I say. there you go. That's exactly. I mean, the patron saint of Cheatham, Todd Snyder. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> that. That was that was where we started, and you know he talked about how Stevie would play there in the seventies, right? You know it kind of snowballed, and then in the nineties we have this kind of stuff going on, and and here we are in two thousand, and there's Randy, and you know Randy's got shows on CMA, and you know all these other kind of artists that are coming in there, and it's, it's unreal. It really is cool that they've been able to keep that that bloodline going. I, totally, know? and the, but that and again, folks like yourself that keep it alive, and that and you know have been doing it for twenty years, and you're going to keep going as long as they'll yeah, let man. you. Well, you and know. it's really great, to, it, you know, his his relationship with a songwriter joint, and my relationship with being in a rock and roll club has really kind of created this baby, which is good company, mm-hmm. because it is a really true merriment of both. And before meeting Hunter and, and being in a relationship with him and like writing music with him, my perspective of songwriting was different. Um, I have always been a performer. I've always been kind of like, kind of barreling through my words to get to the belt part, you know, when mm-hmm. I can kind of like let it all out. And I think that writing songs with Hunter it slowed me down a little bit. It brought the meat into the story to be more important than the than the sh- the showmanship of it. Mm-hmm. Like you know, if it's the song is there, it can be for, it, it can be performed with an acoustic guitar or with a six piece band, or with an orchestra or whatever it is. But you have to have the song, and um, you know the next song that that if we if we do another song with you today, you know it's I think it's a true expression of that. Um, because it's it's just it's truly about the the song and the story, you know. And it was really one of the first times I'd written something so honest, and um, been that transparent, you know, in songwriting. Well, we're definitely gonna do that song. Cool. Uh, I, is it time? Is it, I think it. I think it is. I think we're just about to that point. Yeah, anyway. I lo- you know, I, I lost my mom in twenty twenty, and um, sorry. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> but she she battled. Um, she battled quite a lot emotionally in her life, and, and we lost her all too soon. Um, but it's a song that kind of discusses, um, you know, reaching out for help, but also being the person that has to grab the hand. It's, it's kind of on both sides. So it's a song called The Rescue. Before the 
in good company they'll be at the saxon pub uh what at first thursdays right? every first every thursday, first of, the thursday month. of the month 10 you o'clock catch that band and every thursday at six o'clock you can see the pack that's right uh thank you so much for being on the show oh it's our pleasure so this it's really thank lovely you. to be not only in this beautiful studio but sitting with you and talking about songwriting because uh, to be considered one amongst the many is uh truly humbling thank you i appreciate thank that you all right yeah all right yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank you. good job you guys i'm so much 